Um, conductor exists to empower um, entrepreneurs, small business owners, um, innovators, and we do that through workshops like today, um, and also through one-on-one -on -one consults. We have um, an SME network, which is for um, subject matter experts, where we connect um, with industry leaders for free. Um, and we also do one-on-one -on -one consults with the conductor team, Grace and Jeff are the back, most of you guys know them, and then we have Mallory, Caitlin, and we're missing another Caitlin that um, is not here today. Um, and we also do this through the Our Motivation Center, which is a low cost membership um, to small business owners in the community. I'm so excited to have you here today. Please help me welcome Jacob today. Um, first of all, I want to return. Thank you, Jeff. It's going to slow down. It's just going to slow down fast. <laughs> um, actually, I want to return the favor. Actually, let's give a hand to the Our Motivation Center because we got this chance. The fact that they do this for small businesses, I think, is amazing. Um, when I started my stuff 20 years ago, it would have been awesome to have help like this along the way. So, anybody that's in the room or online that is taking advantage of these types of workshops and any kind of presentation, the one on one they provide, um, great work, keep going, but don't slow down either. Like, be selfish and take advantage of all the stuff you can. They're going to talk about um, artificial intelligence and how small businesses can actually leverage it to their advantage. AI has um, got a lot of spotlight recently because it's becoming more and more accessible. And so a lot of people are curious about it. They're tinkering with it. They haven't really figured out how to apply it in a maybe the most useful way for their business. And so we're going to kind of dig into that a little bit today. First of all, I'll talk about talk to business owners. When you started your business, I'm guessing you were somewhere over here. <laughs> Breaking out of the corporate world, living my dream. It's it's awesome. <laughs> And then four months later, you're like freaking out, right? Like things are happening, you know, it's you know, the real work's begun, the honeymoon period is over. Um, you're kind of wondering if this is a bad decision, you know, it's not comfortable anymore. Anyone that's a business owner, this the 12 month thing, like you're gonna have all the cycles, right? It's like we're good, we're terrible, and we're great, we figured it out, and then we plateau. I don't know how to break through that to the next level, and that's life as a business owner, right? Like I said, I've been, I've been doing this for about 20 years. And I've not once had a season where if it was comfortable, it made me nervous. And if it was uncomfortable, it made me work harder. And if it was going well, I was nervous that it wouldn't go well for long. So there, there's lots of ups and downs in that. So if you're a small business owner, for one, I want to acknowledge you guys as well and, and just say, like, keep at it and take advantage of resources like this. Um, they were talking about AI, like I said. This is one of those game changers for some businesses. It could be a distraction for others. So as we go through this, I want you to think about it more from kind of a mindset perspective before you get into what I call bright, shiny object syndrome and get distracted by stuff that may not really add a lot of value to your business. Like I said, AI has gone, um, gone crazy lately. It's got a lot of news. And so in um, what is that, April, April 25th, Forbes released an article that has a very interesting statistic about AI in the business sense, in the business world. So surprisingly, 64% of business owners believe that AI has the potential to improve customer relationships. That's one thing, especially as a small business owner, juggling a lot of stuff and trying to figure out how do you know the customer experience. And we've seen um, references to that, maybe in larger organizations, and we as consumers kind of get a glimpse of how that could work, but we don't really know what to do with it yet. However, we're showing interest and in the potential to get there. Another 64% said that AI would improve business productivity. Now, this is a really big thing because recently we've seen the demos and, and the videos of things that would have taken possibly hours, half in minutes, and we think, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I've just had this productivity breakthrough. And so we can see the potential in um, using AI to get more productive in our businesses. Another 42% of people believe, or business owners believe, that AI can streamline their job processes. So now to the employee level or jobs to be done, they're curious as to how AI can play a part of that. And also with that comes a little bit of caveats because 35% worry about having the skills necessary to actually implement AI effectively. So if you're in the 35% world, hopefully today we'll give you um, a little bit of guidance and some bearings to kind of figure out um, where you want to take these opportunities. So just to get on a, on a 
baseline level for everybody. We're going to start with some education, but let's get one step back into the basic definition of artificial intelligence. It's quite literally using machines or computer systems to perform tasks that a human would normally perform. So we've been able to get machines and computers to perform levels of tasks, increasingly difficult levels of tasks, without having human intervention or having limited human intervention. So a lot of this stuff, AI, the actual phrase, artificial intelligence, was pulling back in 1954, I believe. But the size of computers necessary to do anything effective with artificial intelligence um, just made it really, but made it really high barrier to entry. And so that's when we get this perception of it's not really for me. But here we are in 2023, and pretty much anybody has access to some very powerful tools with AI. So my goals for today are to go through some education. I'm going to make it very high level, almost crash course, but we have to get on the same page about um, what we're dealing with and how to use it. Uh, second thing, we'll be talking about the possibilities, ways you can actually use um, some of these concepts in your business. And the last thing is just a path of implementation. Just I'm with the next one. That's going to be how we get started. Sound good? Yeah, yes. Awesome. Let's talk about the evolution of AI. Like I mentioned, we, we're talking back into the 1950s and getting up to today. AI started with what's called narrow intelligence. Narrow intelligence is quite literally inputs and outputs. I ask you to do something, the computer is then programmed to do that task, execute the task. There's usually a series of if thens or if sos, and you can really control how that computer works. And so, some of the, the most common applications that we can look at today would be like Netflix recommendations, it's input output. You show Netflix what you like to watch, it tells you what's similar that you might also like to watch. So, it's been very, it's very um, driven by the interaction of, of the consumer. Siri is a good one because Siri is. Um, connected to a wealth of information, you ask a question, it gives you an answer. And chatbots, chatbots in their, I'd say, um, original format are very uh, multiple choice driven, like a choose your own adventure, ask you a question, you choose ABCD, I give you the next answer, ABCD, so on and so forth. So narrow intelligence is just using technology, using computers to get a series of tasks done. And the way you lay out those sets of instructions, a computer can typically generate that much quicker than a human would be able to do. The next level is general intelligence. So general intelligence is where AI starts taking in large data sets and then it ingests all the information and it's starting to make connections and analyses and different uh, recommendations based on what it's, what it's learned. And there's a couple different ways that you can go about leveraging general intelligence there can be some human intervention which we'll talk about in a little bit or unsupervised but the point is we are feeding these computers large quantities of data and asking them for feedback based on their own ability to interpret and process the information that we've given so examples of that the most popular one currently is chat gpt which is a subset of open ai which is a company that's made these um, large language models we'll also get into it in a little bit um, the, the middle one is a, kind of a newer, you can probably recognize that one, Google, um, their AI tool is called BARD, B-A-R-D, that's their large language model. And the last one is IBM Watson, which is arguably the old school OG supercomputer for artificial intelligence. The next phase is super intelligence. Now, this is stuff that you see in movies. This is where AI has taken over, <clears throat> excuse me, you got robots involved thinking on their own, they develop these like neural pathways similar to how the brain works, and they're, for all intents and purposes, fully autonomous. Now, we're not there yet. In fact, the life cycle of AI evolution is not in the middle of general intelligence right now. There's some really cool stuff that we're doing with general intelligence, but there's also more to be done. For example, you could have um, like OpenAI or ChatGPT models give you human input output, but what's being experimented with currently is the concept of letting that model ask itself questions and take its own answers to ask more questions to then find out how to problem solve on its own. So that's touching into super intelligence a little bit, but it's not to the point of full on robotics and and um, and even you know self thinking um, computers in that in that sense. We talk about the AI landscape for a second. So large scale artificial intelligence 
quick, quick uses of the automation like we covered, natural language processing, which is like your, your Siri, any kind of voice command stuff, Alexa, talking to it to get feedback, um, any kind of vision. So your car's ability to have crash avoidance or um, keep you in your lane or Tesla's version of autopilot where it's making some turns for you. It's all vision-based. Text-to-speech or vice versa, speech-text. That's stuff that we've, we've seen for a while. That's kind of your, your base level artificial intelligence being used pretty heavily. There's a lot of adoption in that world. Recently, we dug into machine learning that's gotten more accessible to us. Machine learning has, again, both supervised and unsupervised version. So supervised examples would be like spam detection. Your inbox gets flooded with emails, and you kind of give it a thumbs up or thumbs down. And over time, that machine is going to learn the characteristics of spam based on multiple people's feedback, and then it will start making its own decisions, but it needs a human to intervene and get a guidance. Even ChatGPT, if you tinker with it, it has a thumbs up, thumbs down, barely feedback. Most things now, they want the model to be refined based on a human who is smarter than the machine to give it feedback. Is it a good answer or a bad answer? Even to the point of recommending how it could have been better. So that's, that's more supervised learning. The other of learning gets into like anomaly detection or pattern recognition, inventory management. You basically set this on a path. You train it what to do. And when it spots something out of the ordinary, the machine will alert you, let me know that's happening. It could be, it could be a sudden spike in sales could trigger a loss of inventory, which means you've got to place an order. But that's just looking for patterns and anomalies to inform you for you having to then uh, basically approve or disapprove every single interaction. Now, the next level of machine learning is called deep learning. So deep learning is using its own brain, its own uh, program abilities to train itself. So instead of, like, for example, our face recognition, if, if I show you enough pictures of my face, the machine will get smarter over time to learn what my face looks like and how to associate it with me. So it's not human intervention. But it's also not looking for pattern recognition in that sense. It's actually learning itself over time how to differentiate certain things. There's actually a use case in the marketing world where um, in, in large uh, metros, like downtown areas, you might see these giant billboards or the, the subway uh, posters around like subway stops and things like that. Sometimes there's cameras that are monitoring the foot traffic walking by those, those billboards. And it can do not only facial recognition, but guess on gender and age as well to give you a somewhat loose but surprisingly accurate analysis of the demographics of people that have viewed your physical advertising in, in, in the real world. And so using that sort of work is more in the deep learning world. That all seems fuzzy. It's okay. I'm just letting you know when you hear you talking about deep learning, machine learning, and all these different processes. This is kind of the how we're talking about and how we're, we're using it on a regular basis. Let me walk you through an example of, of how this applies. So this morning, I woke up, it was raining outside in my house at least, and I asked Siri what the weather was going to be like. Siri told me that the weather was going to be raining, surprise, but also that it wasn't going to be raining all day and it was going to be hot. So I chose to leave my umbrella at home, but I don't have an outfit, so I just endured it. After that, I decided to head to work, but then my navigation tool told me that there was going to be an accident that was day, and I could actually save it from minutes so I took an alternate route. So I got to work on time this morning because I was able to leverage AI to let me know that what, what the traffic pattern was going to be for the day. But I got to work, I had a calendar notification telling me about this presentation today, but instead of telling me, hey, it's noon, you should get your presentation by now, it alerted me 15 minutes early. In fact, it was seven minutes early because that's the walking time from my office to this building. So it gave me enough time to get to this presentation as well. Later tonight, I'm probably going to go home and get on my streaming top forums. I want to see those recommendations of new shows to watch or movies to check out based on the things that I've watched in the past. So this is AI in everyday life. If as consumers, we enjoy these conveniences, why as business owners do we not want to give our customers that same level of convenience, right? So there's a couple of concerns that people bring up. What about AI replacing my employees? So, so there's a big issue of like, even in, in my business, there are people that are, that are genuinely concerned, which are experimenting with AI, how it's going to impact their job. Well, surprisingly, AI actually ends up just augmenting positions rather than replacing them. 
So instead of having low level tasks that are delegated to somebody that I can to on a daily basis, I can actually take that off of their plate, but then elevate their position in their job role, which is a big improvement to them because they're able to do what we call, thanks to Jeff giving me this language, top of license work. Top of license means you're working in your unique ability, doing the things that are the best utilization of your skill set, not the meaningful tasks of the day that happen to fall on the plate. So AI will not replace jobs, but it's just going to augment the roles and scopes of humans. Another concern is AI being expensive for small businesses. Like we said, we look at Amazon, Netflix, Walmart, Google, they're leveraging AI every day. And as consumers, we're like, oh, this is amazing. But that's that's Walmart, that's Amazon. There's no way that, that I can use that for any real benefit without it just totally sinking my budget. But actually, because of the latest advancements that we've seen, as you guys may be part of Tinkers with, the access to this technology is it, it's more sensible than it's ever been before. And so there are really a lot of a lot of signals and use cases pointing towards needing to jump on this if you leverage it the right way. Let's talk about the AI superpowers. Now we'll talk about some of the benefits of what we can do with AI. The three main things that I want to highlight today are process execution, customer experience, and data analysis. If you're able to even touch on any of these three or all three together, your business is going to be in a position where it's somewhere to grow. I promise you. And I have some use cases later back in the day. The process execution is basically just using AI to streamline and automate processes. That will be a quick win for your business. Now, there's a couple of ways you can get started with this. If you look at tasks, like I said earlier, that are very repetitive as far as the process for them, but they're also consistent. So it can be something you do every single day, but there's a it's a very going back to the what we learned earlier, input output. By the human, do the input and do the exact same thing every single time. If that's a consistent process, you can build an automation that does that on autopilot. So one really easy way I think is used most often for businesses would be um, an autoresponder email. Contact form comes in. Hey, thanks for your message. We'll be in touch shortly. Nobody touched that. But if you give a boilerplate response to certain things, out of office emails, for example, it's a way to filter certain activity that would normally distract or bog you down. So being able to look at your processes and think of a plan for automating even just a portion of it, you'll start seeing gains in efficiency. And if you're not sure where to start with that, a step back from it would be to analyze your processes. Make sure you actually have clear process and either documented or something that you do on a regular basis. Try to bring up that into a process document and then look for the ways that you can start um, seeking an AI in certain parts of that, of that process. The next level is customer experience. Now, we all know, again, based on recommendations, you probably get emails from major um, online stores that give you, uh, hey, you've, been you've been shopping for this. You probably like these other things as well. All that exists uh, already out in the world. And sometimes we, the business owners, forget the fact that we're collecting this data about our customers and their purchase activity, and we do very little with it. So as a marketer, one of the first things that I encourage people to do is actually think about who your audience is, who your customers are, and can you start segmenting them in any kind of reasonable way. So you might have people, if you have multiple services that you offer, you may have people that are really um, favoring one service but have never explored another. There's a there's a customer experience opportunity there to educate that segment into the new service they never experienced. There's also ways to see that someone has ordered something multiple times, and that could be a great reach out for an upsell or a retention opportunity to get them to come in and buy more or buy more often. Being able to have that customer experience is really helpful. Any kind of marketing that you send out. If it feels generic because you don't know your customer segments, it's received in a generic way. So even down to your social posting, being diverse in the way you talk about the things that you do and the things you offer that you're hitting all of your customer segments, being able to, you know, if you're running paid ads, know your audiences very well and have your message match the audience so you know exactly what kind of content you're putting out that gets the most attention and gets the most feedback. Going to make a huge difference in that personalized customer experience. Again, as a consumer, we expect a personalized experience. 
And so if we're not getting that from somebody, it kind of makes this friction point and wanting to really create the brand affinity that a lot of businesses are coming in with. The last thing there I'll go back up was uh, talking about chatbots. Now, again, chatbots have a very like there's a colorful path. So it goes from it's very input output driven. Now there's ways that you can plug in and train the chatbot to have more intelligent conversation. You can experience it on customer service lines and that sort of thing. If you can give some level of um, what I consider like frequently asked questions or 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 quick answers to a customer 24-7, it could be as simple as what's the status of my order? What are your hours? Do you have specials this weekend? Anything that you can help offer just quick answers to will enhance the customer experience. They don't have to go and dig for the information somewhere else, or have to maybe pick up the phone and call and then get on hold, which is talking to somebody about a simple um, inquiry. So think about ways, even from a chatbot standpoint, that you could um, engage with your customers. If you have a larger company or have multiple employees, sometimes having your information in one um, spot, like a knowledge base, can be really beneficial, but those can also be hard to access or, or kind of pull through. And there are chatbots now that can dig through your knowledge base and be able to give you those answers because, again, we're just training the machine on our business. And then in turn, it can go through those Q&As and pull out just your answers instead of the answers of the entire year. That's because we're experienced. Last one, data analysis. So I put these in order of like level one, level two, level three, somewhat in order of complexity, but also where it feels maybe a little more strategic or, or long, uh, like in the long term plan of thinking. But data analysis, I think, is a gold line for business growth because especially today, businesses of almost any size and shape have access to data about their customers, whether it's website traffic, whether it's a POS, or purchase activity, it's an email list. There's data that exists about your current customers or potential customers. And oftentimes we're collecting it and we do nothing with it. So we have a website, Google Analytics is installed on it because we were supposed to do that. You look at it, and you're like, oh, cool, I had 3,000 visitors this month. Now what? Okay, well, I don't know. That's, that's cool. It's a cool number. If it goes down next month, I'm probably going to freak out, but I don't know what to do with that information. It's just a number on a dashboard. But you can use AI to feed it that data and let it analyze it and offer recommendations, and it can spot those trends, and it can say, actually, your traffic over six months has gone on a steady increase, your time on the page has gone up, customers have been ordering this particular product consistently, so make sure your inventory matches that. Make sure if you want to run a special, these are your best sellers. If this one over here, you're losing money on as far as profitability. Being able to feed it data, let it think about it, analyze it for you, it will uncover some very interesting trends and insights that you may have never even thought about, even if you were to look at the data yourself. So a lot of it can be difficult to kind of ingest and pull through and sort and you know what makes sense, what's relevant, what's not. AI has a really keen ability to process that data, look for those trends, spot you know ups and downs, and even give really solid recommendations based on that. Okay, so the bottom line impact for implementation is going to be cost savings because again, you can automate certain tasks that are going to be time savers, increase efficiencies, you're going to be able to potentially leverage AI in a way that you may have otherwise had to bring in a new employee to help manage that capacity or that workload. So you can really kind of balance um, some of your, your workforce in that way, your resource allocation. You can have your increased efficiency, not just in your day-to-day -day processes, but even across the board. So customer experience can be quicker turnaround, quicker responses. You can leverage these tools to get faster output on things that you may otherwise be just kind of stuck down in the weeds trying to dig through stuff on a daily or weekly basis. The last thing is the competitive advantage. Again, anytime you can increase that customer experience and that satisfaction by making things easier, simpler, more accessible, it can have a huge impact on your business and really give you that competitive advantage. And just thinking about the, the ability to say order online or do a call ahead for a restaurant, little tweaks along the way makes that brand affinity increase where you then create more customer loyalty that could be an advantage against any of your competitors. All right, let's get into a couple of case studies. I'm going to focus on, on my company, Day Creek Media, is because um, I'm closest to it, obviously. We do this a lot for customers as well for our clients, but I wanted to give just like some real use cases, hard numbers that I could pull together. So 
in the last month, we actually automated 100,000 operations in a single month, and that saved us 230 hours of employee time and resource allocation. So just to give some some framework around that, an operation would be a thought, a decision, or an action that a human would have had to do in our day-to-day -day processes in order to complete a task for an internal team or for a client. And so through automation alone, we've been able to put together those, those steps based on input, decisions, and then output based on what you've analyzed to the tune of 100,000 operations per month. But this could be as simple as things going back and forth between teams. So if our team sends an email, if we get a notification from, say, our web team that the site's ready for review, they go chat with the project manager, the project manager puts an email together, send it to the client test specialist, they write an email, change it up a little bit, send it to the client. All those steps can take maybe just a few minutes, but those minutes add up or processing hundreds of tasks every single day. But by just taking some of those simple steps and plugging it into another machine instead of a human to put those things together, which in my communication, we've also increased efficiency astronomically. So that's something that's just one facet of our business. And we're currently digging into other ways from the onboarding process to um, data analysis and reporting, other ways that we can get into our model and, and plug in AI through a couple of different options there. The second thing, I want you to meet our first AI employee. So his name's Sherlock. And, and the team thinks they look a little creepy. I don't know if it's his hat or his, his, his eye or what he stares at you, but Hey, um, Sherlock is an AI project manager. So we've got three project managers on our team already handling all of our client work. And there are internal meetings that happen on a daily basis, oftentimes multiple meetings, sometimes meetings happening, happening simultaneously. In the past, either those teams would have to meet and they would then go cascade the actions to the project manager and then have to go in and make sure the notes were thorough and make sure that all that was communicated properly. Or just to be safe, since it's on them, they would sit in on the meeting and spend 45 minutes or an hour listening for tasks, to do's, cascading messages, taking all the notes, and then they'd go off and, and act from there. So, what Sherlock does is he sits in on the meeting, doesn't say a word. He listens for sentiment analysis, positive, negative, neutral sentiment. He listens for to do's, he listens for tasks, he listens for questions, and he summarizes an entire meeting in a quick summary. And he provides an audio version of that meeting should we have to reference exactly what was mentioned in that part of the, of the meeting, you know, like 14 minutes in, for example. So our project management team then goes and analyzes those meeting notes, those meeting summaries from Sherlock, and he's able, and they're able to save 40% of their time instead of sitting in that meeting for an hour or missing a meeting altogether because they have them at, at the same time. They're able to go through two or three meetings in the same amount of time, catch the notes, and make any corrections if they need to. Sherlock can even listen for to dos and add a task to our project management tool that then the project management team can just clean up the wording a little bit. Maybe it just says, you know, tell Bill to do this by Saturday. Well, it's do the task, assign it to Bill, make the due date Saturday. So there's ways we can clean it up a little bit. The fact that it was captured in the meeting or plugged into our tool, again, huge time savings. Sherlock can also, back to the operations thing, step up, Sherlock can also pass information back and forth in these systems in a hands-off way that keeps our project managers out of the weeds of it. That's two just simple use cases that we're using on a daily basis that feel a little complex, but once you, again, learn what you're trying to solve and how to get there, the tools are out there. So this is my warning to you. <laughs> Do not get distracted by tools. So ChatGPT came out, everybody's super excited. Adopting right blew up 10 million active users. I think last month their daily active users decreased by 10,000 users per day because the, the shininess wore off. It was um it was like a, it was like a cool little experiment. You tell ChatGPT to talk like Thor. You tell it to write a job post for you. You know, little quirky things. Make my meal plan for the week, and then you kind of get bored with it, right? So what you don't want to do is get distracted from your business plan. 
the business plan is where you're heading in your business and how you're going to grow using little um, trinket tools that feel fun then trying to shoehorn into your business is actually um, going to work against you. But keep that in mind. Here's how you actually get started. There's only two steps. Instead of trying to find a way to use the tool, focus on the problem you're trying to solve first. So make a list of every obstacle, problem, barrier, frustration, an idea that you might have, you don't know how to get from it yet, or an opportunity that you've seen that you don't know how to get started with, and make a list of all those things because that's what's holding you back currently in your business. It's not the fact that you can't draft a job resume. You're a business owner, you have a draft resume. What you need to do is figure out how to get on social work more, more um, regularly. You need to figure out why your analytics is dropping. You don't understand what to do with data. There's a lot of little use cases along the way that are the actual problems in your business versus whatever the, the, the cool trick of the day might be. So once you have these problems listed, you're going to ask three questions. Question number one is, if you had an intern, if I had an intern, could I train the intern to do the tasks for me at a level of quality that would be worth it? So if I had to go hire somebody, we have interns in our business, we average about three to five in any given quarter of the year, and we have them do a lot of tasks. What we don't have them do are these really low-level tasks that don't increase their level of learning or engagement in their company or in, the, in their career path. So if I can, if I would have thought to myself, I need to hire an intern to do this for me. Chances are you could train AI to do the same thing. <laughs> Just keep that in mind. I know one classic example, very low level. Um, a lot of people a couple of years ago would say, hey, no, I don't have time to post on social media. I'm just going to go hire an intern from UCA. They're cool and young. They know how phones work. They're going to make social posts for me. Okay, well, now you can have AI learn about your business and give you a social calendar for the month, for the year, three times a day, five times a week, whatever you want. And it will give you a start, right? So it's not doing it for you, it's giving you a start. You have to think about all the nuances because it knows your business. And in general, businesses are uniquely universal. What I mean by that is if you're in an industry, chances are you have a lot of the same. Um, brand positioning, problems that you're solving for customers, uh, certain things that you can do from a service base or a product base. You're the same as multiple people in your industry. Where it gets different is, is AI hey, can help you in that world. They understand the universal business. They don't understand what is universally unique about your actual business. So yes, you might be in financial services, but you might do things a little bit different. And so I can get a lot of cool information about financial services feeling very vanilla until I know more about your unique business, your unique brand business. So being able to take what take a little bit of insight from a high level and distill it down can be very valuable. AI can be trained to do a lot of that stuff for you. Second question: if this task is performed, is a task something that's performed regularly? With a high level of consistency with have repeatable steps. Pro tip, I just talked about that. There were things in our business that had six, seven, eight repeatable steps. It was the exact same thing every single time. So I created an automation that leveraged AI to do the task for me or for my team. So thinking about what are those repeatable steps, it could be every time a new client signs, we go to the Google Drive, make a folder for them. We open up these templates, we put their name on, we put it in the folder. Little menial process things can be turned into automation. Third question, is this task text heavy or data heavy? And does it require either lengthy output or some kind of keen insight that maybe you can't see yet? In that situation, you can use um, GPT, like we talked about earlier, or another large language model, since I want to be exclusive to OpenAI. To create a draft or a summary of the data you've given. Maybe you want to write a blog post. Maybe you want to write a grant proposal. Maybe you want to write a job listing. Anything you can think of. It's a long, a long, long form text. AI can get you a draft to get started. And then again, you put your flavor on it. Or if it's a lot of data, you can actually export almost any data set. You can export in some kind of you know, CSV, Excel sheet, et cetera. You can feed that into AI and have it process, analyze, and think for you to spot those trends. That's going to save you a lot of time. Okay, so to get started, this may be the slide everybody wanted to know. 
What are the tools to use, right? Clear your thing. Start small. Don't try to eat the elephant all at once. Pick one or two things you can do for when this week, um, you know, this month, this year. Look for user-friendly tools and platforms, and I'll talk about those in a second. And then collaborate with any kind of expert you can find for any kind of support and guidance. And pro tip, you got you got one thing in front of you. Three tools that you can use. Zapier is probably one of the most popular automation tools out there. There are others that have different levels of complexity, different levels of simplicity. Zapier is pretty much the bell of the wall when it comes to automation. Very easy to get started and understand. It has a lot of capabilities to connect different systems, make them understand each other, talk to each other, and get things done. ChatGPT currently is, um, you can get it from chat.openai.com. There's a free account you can get into. There's also a paid account you can get into and with a little bit more capabilities. It's very intuitive. It's, it's again, it's chat, it's question and answer. We ask it something, we use you an answer. You can also train it, like I was talking about earlier, to do very complicated things. So don't look at it in novelty. Think about how to level that up with the way your prompt is, is written, the things you want it to do. When you want to teach it about itself to get the best response, think about that. If you're curious about anything else, and I mean anything else, because AI is basically a gold rush right now. If you go to toolify.ai, it is basically scraping the internet for AI tools that are coming out on a daily basis. And it has them all categorized from image generation, audio processing, video processing, data processing, productivity. Again, you name it. You dig into the weeds on that. And you're going to uncover a whole bunch of stuff. And don't forget to not get distracted, right? Because I, I, I went back there just for the presentation. I had it bookmarked for a long time. I would probably go once a month and dig to look for new stuff. And I'm like, ooh, that's that's cool. You mean I can install this extension and flip a little magic wand and things are going to just pop out? And then I think to myself, what problem am I really solving at the end of the day? Like, it's cool. What problem am I solving? Or am I going to waste time going down the rabbit trail? to go into something that really didn't add value to the business. If you have any other questions, um, I'm one of the subject matter experts that Eric mentioned earlier, and I do have office hours once a month um, here at the AIC. You can book time with me. And with that, I will say any open questions you have. Yes? So can you use that to build like a a website or a landing page, like say if I wrote a book and now instead of just going to Amazon and order a book, can I have that AI to build a page so then the other book come out and all this funnel there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there's a lot, even some of the tools now, so Squarespace, Wix, a lot of those um, user-friendly page builders, they're latching on to all the AI stuff. So that's that's one thing I want to mention too. There may be things you're already using. You got an email from them like Canva or whatever. And like, yay, we have an AI now. And it's like, write me a headline and it's been out in the graphic, right? So that's really quick use cases. But there are tools like in Wix, you can give it a couple of answers on this industry, um, this is my offer, and it'll do the whole page layout for you. It's not template, it's template driven. But it wasn't picking a template. It'll write copy for you, put your image here, so on and so forth. You can actually use AI to write the ebook for you if you wanted to do that as well. You can start good. Here's my topic, give me an outline. Now that I have the outline, give me sub points. Now that I have sub points, drop me a paragraph for the sub point, and I'm 80 percent of the way there on an ebook. Come on, play the it, put a logo on it, or go to another image tool and have it generate the cover for me. So the, answer, the short answer is yes, but that would be some of the more like direct steps. There are plenty of uh, platforms out there that will do um, the probably full website. Yeah. So, how much flavor do you have to add for it to not be plagiarism? So, so here's where it gets interesting. There are there, so since the minute that all the that all this stuff came out for AI, then Google said we're going to get smart. And we're going to spot every bit of plagiarized or AI here in the times. I'm not going to even read it. I'm not going to read it a lot. So I, I know when it's vanilla or when it's probably generated. There's one key phrase. So as, as a copywriter, um, I like doing what's called direct response, which means I'm trying to elicit some kind of conversion. So um, your classic sales letters or like the, the direct mail you would get, you're trying to get you to fill out the form, turn the coupon, whatever. So direct response formula is usually lead with the problem. Present the solution, three benefits, call to action. Right between present the problem 
and reveal the solution, AI, 90% of the time, will write, that's where we come in. <laughs> so while that is a very common hook to the next part of the story, the fact that it's there every single time is usually a telltale now that that's just, it's learning from what it's been fed, right? So if I tell it to, to write in a direct response way, the classic direct response copy language is to connect those different sections and frame them. Now, there are ways that you can go in your initial prompt and let it know what your brand is, what your style is, your tone, what your beliefs are, uh, the way you want to do business. You can lay your hands up, not, not generic like casual versus professional. You can get down into the weeds and have it craft more of your brand voice that will feel more natural. And then you can take that and spot the differences and, and pull out, like kind of put your own, put your level of, of human level of content on top of it to get what is an authentic reveal. That, that helps, that makes sense. It's not much different than you, the human, doing research on your competitors. Oh, that's a cool, that's a cool blog post. I write the same headline over here, now it's my content, right? It, the internet has a lot of duplicate stuff. It's just the point at which AI is generating content, which there's a whole lot of um, concern around either the governance of authenticity, accuracy, et cetera. A lot of, a lot of large language models are doing a really, really good job at digging through the um, nuances of accuracy and inaccuracy, or even bias. So AI can have bias based on the knowledge that is being fed. And that's part of why all this stuff is said in beta, because you can thumbs up or thumbs down it, tell it why. And so it's always kind of learn. That's why we're about halfway through this, this evolution phase because there's still a lot of work to be done. But there are ways to just clean that up or to give it a better prompt to start with versus a very blank, generic, you know, one sentence kind of prompt. Um, I just want to know. As a copywriter, mm -hmm. you know, in May they were saying that this was like a 19 year old problem solving skills. Are you seeing improvement in writing skills as the generations go and go and go? What did, what have you actually seen? So, what I would say too is the way, so Jeff had a really good presentation about the, um, the exponential increasing factor of technology, like how it took, you know, the BW Beetle with the same level of uh, technology. Applied, how fast it would go, the fuel economy, et cetera, et cetera, the way computers work. AI is taking that to an entirely different level. It can learn more things in a month. Like if you if you fall behind in a month, that's like being behind 18 months in other, in other words. So even for beta now, there there are ways that it is getting smarter. It's writing more refined copy. You can train it better. It's getting millions of people asking asking it to do things, producing content, giving feedback. So a lot of it is. Learning how to not only manipulate but train the output that you get. Start with a different question, see if the answer changes itself a little bit. Give it more context, even. So if it's not smart yet, if it's a 19 year old, and you're trying to give it, you know, collegiate level stuff, give it the collegiate level stuff first and train it, then ask it questions because now it's just learning what you give it. Like you can feed it an entire book and say, based on what I just gave you, give me X because you just learned this new knowledge. Well, it, let me ask, all right, this is the second part of that, and then you can ask. So, but what my understanding was that because it's language learning, everything that's put into OpenAI is building on itself. That's the exponential growth. So I don't have to put in the college materials that other people are doing, right? So it's just kind of, if I use something like OpenAI, mm -hmm. it's automatically, as other people use it, getting better at it's getting better at response, at crafting the response. But also remember that until you get into the pro versions that are actually connected to the internet, its data is capped in 2021. Thank so you. you can't, you can't, I can ask you about historical information or a particular, um, like let's say there's an expert um, entrepreneur that wrote that wrote a certain book or has a theory about something. It, I can ask you first, do you know this author and this theory? And it will tell me what it does know. Or what I could do is say, this is what you need to know. Boom, 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 boom. Based on this, here's my problem. What do you suggest as an answer? And then it'll give you more um, qualified information. Does that make sense? Yes, that's great. That's great information. Cool. So back into the retail. So the POS system that we use, it collects data. How would we use that to make standard operating procedures and also um, market for us? I think so. Part of it could be based on if you have like frequent customer 
that they need to get tracking. It's like the frequency that they're coming in. They get an outreach program to them. And that loyalty thing is a special that you offer. If there are certain types of packages that are that are commonly like you get, this is my rush of things. Um, or or type, type of boxes or packages that I deliver, large, small, specialty, whatever. Find a way to lean into the thing that you're noticing as a trend that would be different than even going to Staples or you know another store, for example. Um, it could be segmentation based on if you do get um, any, any detailed customer demographic analysis, you might want to figure out which channels you choose to to communicate in for your marketing as well. So can you just why is that legal to email people? Well, if, if, if they give you their information, they kind of, they've opted into that outreach. But you can use the customer data to say, you know, we get a surprising number of business owners. We actually focus on how we help business owners. Or it could be we get a surprising amount of college students. We'll make sure I'm advertising for they see. So it's not necessarily a one to one, but it could be that you know they're one of your better customers. Next time they come in, just it flies with their, you know, on their 10th purchase or whatever. You could have some kind of loyalty program you can roll out, roll it out to the, to the general list, and then the ones that, that are the frequent flyers are going to take advantage of it. So, how would you find your target audience, you know, with the data that's coming in where people are actually really shipping and um, purchase the stamps? Their information is not in there. How would I gather a target audience from that? Because when people ask me that question, what is your targeted audience? Like anybody who spends money? I really don't know. So I was trying to figure out how do I figure that part out? Does your money still have any kind of analytics in the back end? Yes, it does. Okay. I'll probably start there to see what, what okay. is available from it. And then, and then try, to, try to see how you can digest that to get better, better at that. Because there are certain POSs that have customer data deeper than, not like, you don't have an address phone number if you ask for it, but it could also just tell you, in general, you can start segmenting audiences um, based on purchase or credit card activity. Yep. So, uh, like the, I'll, I'll frame the question starting with this. The, the best place to hide a dead body is on the second page of Google search. And so it's all play to win on with search engines. Do you think that people starting to shift towards chatbot interfaces will exacerbate that play to with that 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 pay to win slash biases um, and misinformation when it comes to all these sorts of different prompts? So everyone's using the exact same prompts. And it's all going to a general intelligence rather than a personalized intelligence. I think the way that the way that search. So now we're talking about search algorithm versus versus AI, right? So if 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 I, the business owner, and trying to leverage AI to get output to increase maybe my search presence, optimize this this page for me with SEO best practices, for example, right? There's still a lot of stuff in this the algorithm that determines domain authority. Um, you know, the, the level of engagement from, from inbound as far as organic searches, but we know that AI, we know that, that Google is in the in the business to make money. So even organic, if, if dead bodies are on the second page of Google, the um uh, the bodies that are in critical condition are the organic results because I've got three or four slots of paid sponsored results, I've got three slots of local learner results. And so halfway down the page, if I'm lucky, a couple of spots on my thumb, I get into the organic first answer. If it's very specific search, if it's general search, I've got to deal with what's called zero click answers, which is the question in the little drop down of the answer that doesn't even involve me clicking to your website. Right. So now organic search is even further down the page than that. There's a lot of that fighting for position in search is, is really Google's way of trying to present the most accurate information. I don't know how much AI. Leveraging AI is going to gain your position as much as it will help you as a, as a single business owner add more content to your site, which could be search relevant or it can give your users experience from uh, a place that you have more authority as you're providing more information in deeper settings that, that are in your real areas. So then, does that mean it doesn't matter then? Because if you're paying for the Google's paid ad and it's, it's, it's their Google on their website, are they not just going to go ahead and put the paid people up first on their first one or two pages versus you going to that second page? Oh, they always do. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? 
um, what scares you the most about the direct that general or artificial general intelligence could potentially go? And in terms of like the, the, the data privacy and digital human rights, I think I think what's what's most what's most encouraging, but also I have to trust the source of truth. So like you know everybody for the for every that came out, we were like. Oh my gosh, all this knowledge is here. It's on the internet. It must be true. And now we've gotten smarter to know that that's not always the case, right? And so if and I would say this, if you ever want to take one of these tools, um, ask it what it knows about you. Like put your name in. And it will give you all kinds of whack on information. It could have found your bio on the website. If you're in like in a business world, it can give you a lot of weird information, but it's not always accurate. So I think there's a level, even as humans, we're the same way that that we're spotting um, salesy messages or you know sleazy sales, sleazy ads or bait and switch business tactics, we will get increasingly smarter to spot when things are generic and vanilla. Example: Facebook, three other like when LinkedIn turned into the, the popular business profile uh, for the platform for business social. Businesses would get a Facebook page, they would go and pull all these random feeds about like for me digital marketing. Google gives me 10 articles every day. I just share like, the article on the internet. Not once I talk about my business, why I'm different. I'm just feeding you generic information off of Google, which adds no value to you. But at the time when that was new and shiny, the more the more information that I could give you as a business owner, now I have, I have a place of authority. What that's turned into is people having an opinion on the information. So now authority comes from here's the headline, here's what I think about the headline, where that's going to go. In my industry, so having that entry knowledge, you'll see on our TikTok people are doing the green screen, but here's the headline, and this is my opinion on it. That sort of interaction starts, people are naturally filtering through generic to get to some level of human authority that they can buy into. Does that help? Does that make sense? Do you see problems with that though? I think as long as people are still in the business of Communicating solutions, why there's just the bad, tackling those concerns head on. It just it's just more questions or concerns for the for the consumer, which then would make me as as wanting to be a leading business owner or, or someone to help my audience be able to navigate through those things and those challenges. Well, like my only concern is say there's no decentralized identity to each person and user on the internet or content creator, anyone of, of authority that's comment commentating on, on information. Um, I mean, anybody can create a deep fake of that person with all this public internet data and all of a sudden fool and and and, and lie to whatever their whoever their audience is. I mean, I just see like the the whole exacerbation of the problems on the current internet, just kidding. Have, have you thought about when humans in whatever part of the world go and snatch someone's profile picture off social, make a fake profile, add a bunch of friends, and then next thing you know, don't accept my new friend request. That has nothing to do with the robot or AI at all. So it's not like it's a big problem, it's just being able to spot those things quicker, more accurately. I mean, all those using defects for a while. I can get a defect of myself next week if I want to, one of our vendors. And so, you know, it's out there. It's just a matter of whether or not, uh, how I want to leverage that, whether I use it for good or for evil. And that's pretty much anything in the world, right? Definitely. Yeah. I was curious how you ended up getting Sherlock. That was my question. <laughs> that was my question. Yeah, so there, there are a few tools out there um, that will do. I don't know if you've been on a tech support call with anybody, like a vendor, and they and there's this um, somebody that joins your your video meeting, and then they're for quality assurance, or if you're on a call with someone, um, customer support, and they say this call is being recorded for quality purposes. The same stuff. There, there's several out there, like Otter, Otter.ai is one, Darklaws, and S Pearl is another one. But if you search for um, like meeting assistant, there's a ton of options out there. So on that outer AI for retail, so like say for inventory, and if it's all going into your system, would our AI allow you to train that system for the incoming boxes and outcoming boxes? No, no plan to keep count of your um your your inventory. That tool, uh, that's just for that's just for like meeting, uh, like video meetings or virtual meetings. That is like an assistant for virtual meetings. 
but there are certain POSs, and then this is kind of at a use the case by case level, even in the retail, like the restaurant industry. Um, it really depends on the ability of your point of sale system to monitor inventory, spot anomalies, or if there are tools out there, which there are, to have to be able to integrate with your point of sale system and put the two things together. So there, it, sometimes it can be an integration that's necessary if your point of sale doesn't already have that ability, where it's your point of sale is linked to your inventory in real time. There could be third party tools that could come in and monitor what you have on hand, look at historical purchase activity, spot and all et cetera. That could have the key businesses like a restaurant from running out of lettuce on a Thursday, right? It's being able to spot not the not the manager knowing that, oh yeah, we had a huge influx, you know, two uh, two days ago. I'm gonna run out by Thursday, I have to order some more. It's letting technology monitor what you have on supply and then signal it when it's time to do that. So then, like, say, if I have the postal mate POS system, then would I have to go to a postal mate and get permission for this third part to integrate with it? If they say they're already a vendor, like a provider or an integrator, they've already worked out. Okay. So, with so I know there's a lot of assistance with Zooms and Google Meets and all sorts of like team meetings, but have you found any tools to monitor to incorporate phone calls as well? And text messages. There are some. I don't have specific names on them offhand. There, there are some. Like from the, from the voice standpoint, there are some that you have to basically route your. You, you have a, your number. It's not your cell phone number, and you have to route your call through that first. You got to be able to record it. You got to be able to record the audio to do all the process. Um, on the on the messaging world, um, we have uh, we've done launched for several clients. We had a contact form was submitted or an inquiry form or a lead form. Anytime that there's a spot to leave feedback, comments, questions, et cetera, we analyze that box for sentiment analysis. So let me run off hand. We have this one, they're not happy. This one, they're curious, this one's excited. And then over time, you can start looking at all that and see trends about if people want to contact us, should you complain? That's not good. How do we fix that? So there's lots of little ways you can just kind of sneak in um, things like sentiment analysis or even helping draft responses. And lots of uh, uh, that tool of fire site, which be lots of extensions that'll plug into your email that'll help you draft a response based on the data or the email that's coming in, you know, coming in inbound. So how do you how do you keep from getting calls like so they'll call in and say FedEx almost ran over my grandma because they can't get in touch with the real FedEx people because they have a 1 800 number, which is a robot that they can't get to. So then when they call Postal Bank because we're the real people, then they just start, you almost hit my cat. They threw my packages on the ground. How do you divert those calls? Because that takes a lot of time for me trying to answer the problem. And I don't just want to be like rude and interrupt, like maybe you're talking to the wrong person. So how do you? Forgetting that when the robots are not answering, so they're just calling the real people that will answer. Yeah. Do you have an answering service on the front end? Yeah, me. Like, thank you for calling. <laughs> like, thank you for calling Post Man. Like, when I'm gone, like, in the evening time. What about just any right, right off the bat? I mean, not, not even a press one, just a pre message before it actually rings you. No, I don't. There are some call services that'll give you like a pre message and it'll say, to your, your example, if you have a concern with the delivery of your package, please call the carrier. We're a provider of shipping service. Does that make sense? It's yeah. Just, it's just kind of getting further off the drop from. So where do you get that from? There, I mean, there, there's a lot of call services that oh, I'll say you can yeah, like, yeah, like a customer service call on. Mm -hmm. So something I'm seeing other countries start adopting is regulation around AI. And I'm curious, you know, what your thoughts are in time frame. I think it's not a matter of if, but when we start enforcing regulations like we did on advertisements where they have to literally state this is a paid ad, you know, say this is paid by artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, as a business owner who's already adopted this pretty regularly, um, I'm worried it's going to change my functionality in a year and six months or something where now, you know, I don't want to publicly say I made this with AI, you know, so, and I'm scared that's going to kind of change my processes and how I do things because I now have to promote this or do something different. Yeah, I think it's a matter of, for one, time will tell because we don't really, we don't know, we don't know yet. Like the fact that there's, um, it has been open to the masses 
there's a lot of, of novelty to it, like I said earlier, where people are just kind of pressure testing what's possible. Can I trick it? Can I make it say things that then it shouldn't say? And so on and so forth. The same way that ads were really, really um, kind of wild west until they were, it's going to be the same issue with AI. It's just a level of, it's just a matter of how we spot where things are going off the rails and then what, whether it's government or whoever, decide that they want to enforce regulation, which then is a whole other political issue that I want to get into. Um, so I think it's just a matter, it's really a matter of how, when it starts creating blowback, then what do we do with it? Because like even on a website, we have to do the GDPR, you know, we're going to collect your data, cookies, pixel you, et cetera, et cetera. You got to opt into that. There, there could be levels of, of either regulation of transparency or how things are used. If you use a, if you use an AI tool to generate um, a social calendar or make you a cool headline, I don't see any kind of enforceable regulation on getting an assistant with that versus hiring a human to it for you. So I think it just comes down to use cases. I mean, you know, all these recommendation engines, the fact that we're letting the biggest companies in the world um, listen to us and they say our data is protected, it's just going to be their little silo. We have to trust them that that's you know, the facts or the case. So um, I don't think it's something that we can really get a grasp on until we see what what comes of it. You know? Anything else? All right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming out today. If you learned something new, um, enjoyed the session, please follow us on social media and share your pictures from today. Um, we are just so excited. So happy that you guys are here. And hopefully you check out um, all the folks that we have on the end of your feet. Do you guys have a great day?